Um, we'll get started, Brittany. What do you think? Yeah, she Sounds has good. the recording. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody from all over. It's so exciting to have um, people just from so many places here. You're going to listen to a wonderful physician, Dr. Natalie Gentili. She is, and if you're in the Pittsburgh area, she is a primary care physician and she specializes in lifestyle medicine. And not only she's a wonderful physician, charming, wonderful, nice. She's also a wonderful, charming, and nice person. So you're going to learn so much. But I also have to mention that Happy Vegan is, is sponsor, helping to sponsor. So when you get, everybody here is going to get an email from me tomorrow with a recording here and anything that comes up in the chat. And you'll also get a coupon for 30% off of nacho cheese spread from the Happy Vegan. So I got mine in the pantry here just to show you. I feel like I'm a, on a commercial here. Um, in the meantime, if you would be on mute while Dr. Gentili talks, if you have any questions in particular, of course, put them in the chat and we'll try to get all your questions by the end. So without further ado, I will turn it over to the Wonderful. Let me just see if I can share my screen correctly. And then if I press play, are you guys able to see this? Good. Okay. Wonderful. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sally. Um, it's so awesome to see all of these faces tonight. And it's really nice to get a quiet break away from my house right now to just have a discussion with you guys tonight. Um, so as Sally said, I'm a family medicine physician, but I also am boarded in lifestyle medicine. And uh, tonight I want to talk with you guys about how I want to kick off our optimizing your health series about how the gut, uh, it, how important the gut is when it comes to our body's health. And in particular, we're going to talk about diet because we are plant-based Pittsburgh. We are going to talk about diet in particular. Um, I also will plug for Happy Vegan, the Nacho No Cheese. I've been using it as um, like the cheese spread in my lasagnas lately. Really fun thing. So give it a try. Um, so I am a, a direct primary care doc, which means that I have um, a different type of model of practice and I spend a lot of time with my patients. So in my practice as a family med doc and a lifestyle medicine doc, I see patients really regularly talking about things like gut health, talking about diet, talking about lifestyle and how that impacts our health. So the field of lifestyle medicine in particular helps us address how our Lifestyle habits like our diet, exercise, social support, um, substance use, how these things affect our risk for chronic disease, preventing chronic disease, reversing it and treating chronic disease. And so really I try to empower my patients and I hope that tonight's discussion empowers you. This quote by Thomas Edison, I always, when I teach the med students this particular talk, I start with this. The doctor of the future will give no medicine or maybe just some, but not a ton, but will instruct his or her patients in the care of the human frame, in diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. And this is really what, this is the, the main focus of how I try to treat patients every day. Because these in my mind are modifiable things that we can take charge of each day to try and be healthier. So when we look at the dietary conditions um, across the most populous countries in the world and how these dietary conditions link to health, we really see that this list is the standard American diet in particular. You know, our diet in across the country in general is high sodium. It's low in our fruits and vegetables, our nuts and seeds, our legumes, low in fiber, low in our polyunsaturated fatty acids, and it's high in processed meat, red meat, processed foods, sugar-sweetened beverages. And we then, therefore, can it's not a huge leap to think that 70 plus percent of the leading causes of death in our country are attributed to poor lifestyle habits. So as a primary care physician, 
truly the majority of the things that I see when I help my patients can be traced back to lifestyle habits. Some would look at this and say, oh, this is terrible. You know, there, this is just such bad news. But I actually see it as a really positive thing because it gives us the chance to make some changes to help our population become healthier and to help ourselves and our families become healthier. A lot of times I hear, well, everyone in my family has problems with X, Y, and Z, chronic disease. And so I'm going to have that. But your genes don't have to determine your destiny. And that's really what we're going to talk tonight. It, gut health is a prime example of this. Um, the field that refers to how our lifestyle affects the way our body expresses disease is called the field of epigenetics. And really what it sums up is genetics loads the gun, yes, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And we hear this all the time um, in the plant-based world, especially because we realize that, yes, we've got a genetic makeup, but our lifestyle habits really pull the trigger on how our body is going to express either a healthful lifestyle or a disease promoting lifestyle. One of the biggest factors in epigenetics is that we can have an effect on is our diet. And so tonight's talk about the gut microbiome and gut health is so closely tied to epigenetics. And I'm gonna tell you why. So who, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you guys have heard of the gut microbiome. And if not, it's a really fun, new, sexy topic that a lot of research is coming out about. Um, and that I've really grown to apply to a lot of visits, um, a lot of times when I vi have visits with my patients. I should also plug that, especially if you're just entering now, please at any point, um, I'm happy to you know, I'll keep the chat feature up because I'm happy to be answering questions if you have them. But Sally, can you alert me if people have questions? I just want to make sure that I can see them. Oops. Now I can't even see my, one sec, technical difficulties. Okay. So anyway, please speak up and ask questions. So the gut microbiome is this collection of trillions of microorganisms. So we actually have significantly more genetic makeup from bacteria in our bodies than our own human genome. So we are day by day carrying around these microorganisms in our gut microbiome and created a little home for them in our gut. And it turns out that 70% of our immune system, which as you all know, is a, a big time topic on you know the front and, front and center of our minds lately, 70% of that immune system is in constant contact with the gut microbiome. Wow. We also know about the gut microbiome that there are different species of bacteria in our gut have preferences for different types of fiber. So we've got picky bacteria in our gut microbiome. The gut microbiome develops in several different ways and is very much affected by our environment starting before we're even born. So during pregnancy into that process of delivery, Studies show that babies born by vaginal delivery have this early abundant expression of the good gut bacteria. So these are the lactobacillus, the bacteroides, the prevotella, for example. Babies born by C-section have lower levels of those good bacteria or even delay an onset of expression of those bacteria and a higher amount of some of these bad, what we call bad gut bacteria move a little bit further into life into the process of breastfeeding. So babies that are breastfed, again, the good gut bacteria begin to be expressed in the gut. Whereas those that are formula fed, we see higher numbers of the bad gut bacteria being expressed. Diet, obviously we're gonna to touch mainly on, and then antibiotic use. So we see a reduction in the diversity of microbes in our gut when we are, when there's antibiotic use. And it's no surprise, 80%, this is astounding, 80% of antibiotics in the US are administered to livestock as part of animal agriculture. So we've got this breeding grounds for antibiotic resistance in our own gut bacteria. The surface area of our gut is the size of a tennis court. So 3,000 plus square feet of surface area on the gut. And it's this folded and convoluted. And I'm sure you've seen the you know, anatomy pictures of this gut that travels down across the abdomen with tons of little layers as well along that, those uh, surface lining. And that's why it can be so huge. And the enterocytes, entero meaning gut, sites meaning cells. So these gut cells 
are a nice single thin layer that hangs out and is the only gatekeeper between the rest of the world, AKA our gut lumen where food goes through and the outside environment can come in and then the rest of our body. So think about this super thin layer of enterocytes and they're hooked together bit by bit by bit, cell by cell by cell, hooked together by these tight junctions, okay? And that'll come back into plan. You'll hear about that. So enterocyte health, as you can imagine, when we've got this one single lining layer between the outside and the rest of our body's function on the inside, that's so imperative that we keep that lining healthy, right? Because those gatekeepers, we've got to keep them happy and healthy. And this, this process flow is my way of just simplifying. We eat fiber from plants. These are our prebiotics. The good gut bacteria make this product called short chain fatty acid called butyrate. And that helps feed those enterocytes and keep them healthy. So butyrate is this big time signaler that's so important telling our body that things are going well. Things are going well, body. I've got some good gut bacteria that are proliferating. They're making this butyrate and we've got a good balance of bacteria right now, okay? So immune system, you don't have to be in inflammatory mode. You don't have to be going, you know, cell signaling and going off because butyrate's at a good level. We've obviously got good back gut bacteria. And I think it's just so fascinating because going through medical school training, for example, I, first of all, didn't get any training in nutrition. I certainly didn't get any training in, in gut health. Um, didn't get any training in that in residency. And this hasn't been until honestly the past two years or so that this has started to become like a hot topic that's being studied scientifically. So this is all constantly evolving, but we really look at this and can see, holy cannoli, this is a really big deal when it comes to our health, right? Like this is a, this is an area where we can target our interventions and, you know, it, enact long lasting health. So gut dysbiosis is when things aren't going so hot, okay? Things aren't going well. We've got some damage to the gut microbiome in some way. Those tight junctions, right? Those junctions between those enterocytes, they start to break down. Then we've got, because those gatekeepers are, are broken down and falling apart, we've got intestinal permeability, meaning that things can sink in between those tight junctions. And bacteria, bad bacteria, produce what's called endotoxin. It gets through those gates and causes inflammation in the body. So again, our goal is to keep those tight junctions tight and keep them touching and keep that cell layer healthy. And that process is called gut dysbiosis, which that word dysbiosis means essentially off kilter, bad, not functioning bacteria or biosis. So the gut microbiota, so these gut bacteria, all of these microorganisms have different metabolites, AKA they produce different things. For example, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, these are good gut bacteria and they're involved in the process of synthesizing or making folate. So folate biosynthesis is implied in protecting us against things like colon cancer inflammatory processes in the body, like inflammatory bowel disease. Gut bacteria that produce biotin are significantly impacting our host immune function. Short chain fatty acids, these are those, those big time important ones, right? Like butyrate that we talked about. These are metabolites that are made from bacteria fermenting the fiber that they eat, right? So back to this slide, we had the fiber that we eat, the good bacteria make that short chain fatty acid and that helps keep our enterocytes healthy. These short chain fatty acids that are produced are imperative when it comes to immune system function and benefit. They also though are important when it comes to metabolic disease. What's metabolic disease? Metabolic disease is something that I personally as a primary care doc see day in and day out that every one of us has either personally been affected by or knows someone who has been affected by. This is our high blood sugar, diabetic patients, those with obesity, high cholesterol, 
So insulin resistance, metabolic disease reversal, that's where short chain fatty acids play a role. They also, as we talked about, are the energy source for the enterocytes, AKA colonocytes, okay? Now, TMAO has definitely been front and center for many more years. We've heard, um, many of you may have heard of TMAO. So TMAO is trimethylamine and nitric oxide. When we have an increased intake in our diet of foods that are high in carnitine or choline, so we're talking energy drinks, eggs, red meat, dairy products. So when we have a high intake of these types of foods or supplements, the gut bacteria says, I see you TMA. And in the liver, we have production of TMAO. And TMAO consistently is linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and renal disease. Cardiovascular disease and renal disease are two of the top 10 causes of death in the United States, time and time again. So to break it down, or I'm sorry, to summarize this process, we've got microbes in the gut. They have these certain metabolites that they create for better or for worse. That influences the metabolism in us, the host body, which then affects our genes. We have modulation of our genetic expression. That's that epigenetics. That epigenetic expression change leads to disease production. And gut dysbiosis, aka problems with those microbes, is associated with an increased incidence of inflammatory diseases, cancers like colon cancer, breast cancer, and metabolic disease. Does anybody have questions so far? There are a couple questions here. Um, one is, is there a link between elevated CRP and dysbiosis? Yeah, so elevated CRP is, a, is referring to the C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is one of the inflammatory markers that we can check in someone's blood work. Inflammatory markers tend to be what we call very nonspecific. So it can be elevated for a lot of different reasons. CRP can be elevated because you've got the flu. CRP can be elevated because you've got rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it can be elevated for a lot of different reasons. So just because someone has an elevated CRP does not equate to gut dysbiosis, but gut dysbiosis could lead to an elevated CRP. So yeah, it's not bi-directional. Okay, thank you. And Connor wants to know, he, um, Connor just went plant-based, loving it, specifically whey for protein mixes, how a food product, say a croissant with lots of dairy butter and some milk may be less detrimental, I'm sorry, less detrimental than a whole glass of milk. Still trying to find the balance, of course. Oh, yeah. Is well, there any discrepancy between foods where dairy is cooked, baked versus raw? So I guess what I'm guessing Connor is saying that um, I was basically asking about dairy. Yeah. What's your well, let me preface this by saying that, first of all, if any of these questions I don't know the answer to, I'm going to say I don't know the answer to. Just that. Um, so I, I'm putting that out there first at full disclosure. Um, second of all, I am a full proponent of a plant-centered and plant-based lifestyle. When I counsel my patients, I understand that many people are on the journey or they're on a spectrum of how they eat. Um, so I very much appreciate where you're at with that, Connor, uh, and understand that. When it comes to dairy, as far as cooked dairy products versus like a glass of milk with regard to gut bacteria health, I don't know if the studies have been done to discern that. I would have to look into that. I will say that it's super hard to do nutritional research. So if you think about it, we, are, we eat so many different things each day. And when it comes to gut bacteria and gut health, if one is doing a research study where they're just looking at like, how does eating broccoli affect gut bacteria? 
the gut bacteria might do well, but it's not going to be as happy as if you had broccoli and Brussels sprouts and red peppers and another diff and, you know, whole grains. So what it turns out is, is the more plant diversity we have, the better. So in someone who's eating like a drinking a big glass of milk versus, you know, baked some type of baked dairy good, I don't know the effect specifically on gut health for that, but I do know that if you're going to have that, maybe that's with a side of a big old thing of, you know, vegetables and a big bowl of salad. Um, or you have that with some type of whole grain later in the day that is, you know, coupled with some legumes. So we do know that the more plant diversity you have, the better. And I, I just want to add there um, is, I know that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in regards to dairy, they always say, take the precautionary, print. they use the precautionary principle, and which is they, there is some relationship, how strong, not sure, but their take is it's better not to yep. for a variety of reasons. And especially the protein and dairy, the casein, mm -hmm. um, the, it's very pro-inflammatory. Exactly. And I always say, listen to your body. I mean, how does your body feel when you have, have a lot of dairy? You know, if your body is getting, you know, very bloated and you're starting to have more flatulence and discomfort or diarrhea, your body's telling you what it needs to tell you. And we have one more quick question from Sean. Do you know if there are any efforts for medical schools and healthcare training programs to include more info about plant-based nutrition? <laughs> we wish, yeah. Um, so I know personally at Pitt, I've started teaching there about exactly that. So I've started teaching a nutrition um, part of their family medicine rotation. Um, and there are definitely more grand rounds that are happening at Pitt Med. So that's been great, but it's still very much still in its infancy. When I was at Mayo Clinic, it was still very much in its infancy. Um, so I, I think there are other parts around the country that are doing this slowly and trying to implement it. And that is just nutrition. Now, plant-based nutrition, that is, that's an effort. That's an effort. Yeah. But I, I truly, it doesn't matter what, what field of medicine you're in, this is applicable. Okay, thank you, Nan. That's all the questions for now. Okay, cool. And I, I don't like to talk a ton, so I like, please just um, keep coming with questions if you have them. <laughs> all right. So when I think of gut health, and I was thinking tonight, what might resonate with a lot of, with most people, there are three main things that I see a lot of, and that's IBS, AKA irritable bowel syndrome, leaky gut, AKA permeability between those tight junctions and bile acid malabsorption. So irritable bowel syndrome, um, this can be constipation predominant. It can be diarrhea predominant or it can be mixed, what's called mixed IBS, which has diarrhea and constipation. People tend to have pain associated with that, and they tend to have issues, that pain associated specifically with their bowel movements. And irritable bowel syndrome can be helped by improving gut health, you know, shocker. And so we'll talk about that in particular when it comes to prebiotics. Leaky gut is still very, um, not very, not, I, wanna, I don't want to say misunderstood, but I'd say understudied. It's still a big unknown as far as what that, how we can fix that intestinal permeability. Um, what I'm understanding right now is that it's what comes first, the chicken or the egg. So has there been some type of underlying insult to the body that has led to that leaky gut or intestinal permeability? Or did that lead to the issue? Did the intestinal permeability then lead to the underlying condition? And so I, my understanding is that's still being worked out, but we do know that when there is that leaky gut, there's the leakage of the bacterial endotoxin, which then increases inflammation in the body. Bile acid malabsorption is one I do get a lot of questions on um, and is again, a very much underdiagnosed condition so I thought I'd put up a little picture because in case some people have questions about bile acid malabsorption. So 
this big red guy on the left side that looks like a like a jellyfish without legs that's the liver and then you have on the right side of the picture the stomach is that huge big piece of bubble gum that leads into all of the little tubes of the small intestine and then the large intestine and then the um little like finger pointing out of there that's your pancreas the green guys that are the jellyfish legs are is the part of the biliary tract so if you've heard of the gallbladder or the bile ducts that's what's communicating between the liver into the int small intestine there so the liver makes bile and the gallbladder stores it and then that gets delivered down into the intestinal tract and that bile is helpful when it comes to fat digestion. So when one has bile acid malabsorption, the, you can gather from that, that they're not absorbing back the bile acids like they're supposed to. So you get an excess of bile acids in the gut. And that excess of bile acids is actually one of the most underdiagnosed causes of chronic diarrhea. Um, people with bile acid malabsorption have issues with fecal urgency, fecal incontinence, watery stool. And when we have stimulation of what's called bilophilic, aka bile loving, so philic meaning loving, bile loving bacteria, when those bad bilophilic bi bacteria grow in the gut, they are part of pr converting primary bile acids into secondary bile acids which has been linked to colon cancer development. So when we have an excess of bile acid production and an excess of those bilophilic bacteria, that is theoretically part of the issue when it comes to inflammation and can colon cancer development. There are medications to help with bile acid malabsorption. Um, I won't go into that tonight um, as obviously that's not really in the scope of this discussion, but that is something um, that you can look into as well. So one of my favorite books, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, Fiber Fueled by Dr. Bolshewitz. You know, it's a bomb book. It's just, it's too good. And I go back to it a lot um, just for reference when I'm talking to patients, but this is a great equation. I'm a really simple person. So this makes sense to me. Um, prebiotics, which is our fiber that we typically eat, plus pro probiotics, which is the actual bacteria and yeast, equals the postbiotics. Those are the short chain fatty acids. Remember we talked about how awesome those are, the butyrate in particular. The ultimate goal is down there at the end of that equation to get more postbiotics, get more short chain fatty acids. So how can we do that? Well, we've got to amp up the left side of this equation, right? I was a math minor, so I can kind of understand. <laughs> we need more on that left side so we can get more on that right side, correct? So let's talk about how we can get better proliferation and more of those good probiotics by our diet. This was a study that was done in published in Nature, the journal Nature, which is a big deal in the year 2013. This study took one group and made them the plant-based group. So the plant-based group said for five days, you're only eating plant-based foods. So whole plant food intake. Other group, you're the animal-based group. So you only eat animal products for five days. Then they had the fun job of collecting stool samples from these people and analyzing their gut bacteria. The plant-based group, spoiler alert, they did great. Right, the gut bacteria was primarily the anti-inflammatory microbe production. There was a proliferation of short chain fatty acids that were produced. The gut was doing what it's supposed to do, which is it adapts to what we eat. You generate the good microbes that are good at breaking down fiber because that's all that group was eating, was high fiber intake. Animal-based group on the other end of the spectrum, had reduction or disappearance of the anti-inflammatory microbes. So not only did we lose the good bacteria, we gained this different type of bacteria that were biophilic, right? We talked about that loving bile. Okay, we got a lot of animal fat. Let's secrete bile, bile, bile. Well, these bile-loving bacteria are like, let's do this. Pro-inflammatory bacteria start to be in abundance. 
in one particular example is Bilophila wadsworthia. That has been specifically linked to development of inflammatory bowel disease, i.e. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. So animal-based group, they've got antibiotic resistance developing. We already talked about why. They've got loss of the short-chain fatty acids because no fiber was consumed. So how can we make the short-chain fatty acids? But was what I find enlightening and so empowering about this was flip-flop the groups. And what happened? The same exact results. So animal-based group went plant-based. Good stuff happened. Plant-based group went animal-based within 24 hours, those animal-based results happened. So again, I try to see glass half, half full here. Yes, there are things that throughout our lives, uh, let's start, we had that, you know, that, that um, slide where I was talking about from infancy, you know, like, hey, I was born by C-section fed formula. Wow, am I going to forever have a terrible gut? No. I, you know, for 20 years, all I ate was steak and cheese. Am I screwed? No, there are, there is a chance for you to make some flip-flops in your dietary intake and lifestyle to help get your gut health back to where it needs to be. There is a question from Nicholas. Did the animal-based group consume grass-fed beef or free-range chicken or were they grain-fed? Is it known or unknown? I don't know. I'd have to look at the um, the methods on that study. I'm sorry. Is there another another question? Anybody want to throw me a softball? Okay. Um, so the, <laughs> thanks for laughing, Steve. Okay. So um, in Lancet, another great journal in 2018. This was a really cool study too. I, I remember one night when I was putting together one of my talks for the med school. My husband was like, "Do the study with the U-shaped curve." I was like, "What are you talking about?" And it's this study. So U-shaped curve, when we have those types of results, the lowest part of the U is good. So on the left-hand side of this study, we see a hazard ratio, meaning the hazard, the risk of somebody, of, of all cause mortality. So any cause of death. And then on the bottom, we've got the percentage of your energy intake from carbohydrates. And I'm talking about the carbohydrates in the sense of our whole grains, our legumes, our chickpeas, our lentils, our fruits, our vegetables, how much carbohydrate intake compared to, it is ideal when it comes to all-cause all mortality. It's a, it landed right at 50%. So, you know, a solid portion of your diet, we're not talking about some, you know, starvation diet where you're not allowed to eat any carbohydrates. This is 50% of your diet coming from carbohydrate intake related to the lowest hazard ratio of our all-cause mortality. So again, when we're talking about what's the optimal stuff that we're supposed to be intaking, this is further support. So what the heck are prebiotics and pro pro probiotics and postbiotics? Okay, prebiotics, aka pre-bacteria, are the things that feed the bacteria. And Dr. Bolshewitz in Fiber Fueled always says, start low and go slow. Because when it comes to rebuilding our gut health, Prebiotics are, it's okay to take supplementation of prebiotics if you need to. If you're one of my patients, you know, I'm not super psyched about a ton of supplements. I'm always like, all right, let's, let's keep it real when it comes to supplement intake. But prebiotics are actually the fiber that we eat every day. There are prebiotic supplements that you can have to supplement what you eat. And they are in the form of soluble fiber, which, mean, which means that they dissolve. They're easy to use. And studies show that if you consistently use them, if you're consistent with them and you use small amounts of them going low and slow, that can be helpful in reducing gut dysbiosis. In particular, irritable bowel disease can be helped by prebiotic intake. We've got promotion. It's all the same themes. Promotion of good gut bacteria growth helping with short chain fatty acid production, decreasing the pH, AKA increasing the acidity in the colon. And I'll tell you why that's important. And then again, reducing your dysbiosis in the gut. The pH in the colon, the more acidic we can, it becomes, the more we've got killing off of the pathogenic, AKA the yucky bacteria. And we'll talk about that in this slide. But first, let me tell you about the supplements you can get. Prebiotic supplements, um, these are just a few of them. 
I'm sure many of you heard of psyllium, for example. This is the seed husk from the plantago plant, beta-glucans. These are found in seaweed, oats, wheat, bar wheat barley. Guar gum, I see that all the time in my plant, in my nut milks. And I'm always like, what the heck is that? It's actually a, leg a um, legume type plant. Um, but these are prebiotic supplements that you can get. And they're typically not super expensive and they can be dissolved like in your coffee in the morning. If you're wanting to slowly try and rebuild gut health, this may be, again, this is not for everybody, but this may be something you implement is trialing a different type of prebiotic. Fermented foods. This is our science, science experiment, right? So this is where, you know, Natalie gets the jar and try, tries to make kombucha, like weird things, right? Weird things are going on when we do our fermented foods, but some people are really good at making it. Um, so fermentation process drops the pH. Say we're, say we're putting stuff in a jar here. We drop the pH and create this acidic environment. And that's a bad environment for bad bacteria. And it's a good environment for our short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. So that's the goal. Because basically what happens is when you dunk that sour, that cabbage underwater to create sauerkraut, for example, you are taking away the oxygen source. So anaerobic, so non-oxygen loving bacteria start to grow and we get that, that more acidic environment. Fermented foods also contain prebiotics. They contain vitamins and other wonderful polyphenol compounds that are helpful. And you get a lot of different living microorganisms in fermented foods. So fermented foods are, are, are wonderful to just add to your daily dietary intake. I bring that up as opposed to, not as opposed to, but maybe a little bit in contrast to probiotics. Um, so probiotics, these are more of a transient effect. This is your capsule that has a concentrated amount of some live strains of a few different bacteria. And you transiently get a good, good effect. So take my probiotic for, you know, seven days. And that helps with the, uh, helps synergize with the other gut bacteria to make some short chain fatty acids. But once that's done, once that's through my system and I stop taking the probiotics, those gut bacteria don't stick around. My body already has its own gut microbiome that it's setting up. Thank you very much. I don't need a bunch of extras, right? So that's kind of how the gut microbiome thinks. So yes, there are specific scenarios where probiotics are useful, um, but they are not something that across the board, everybody needs. When we go back to that fancy equation, if we want probiotics, our good probiotics, AKA our good gut bacteria to proliferate, let's just give them the prebiotics that they need. Let's give them the fiber that they need. When it comes to what we are supposed to eat and why, it comes down to phytochemicals. So I'm, and I know this doesn't come up well, but that's such a pretty picture. So I just couldn't bring myself to get rid of it. Um, but let's talk about phytochemicals, high antioxidant activity. So phytochemicals are plant chemicals, high antioxidant activity, reduction of stress signaling in our cells, block the pro-inflammatory compounds. This is what it comes down to and what we should be eating plant There's, foods. Oh, do you want to, want me to just, just give you a couple questions that came up? I would love that. Okay. So Corey asks, I recently read that fermented food isn't really good for us. Do you suggest that not to eat or to eat fermented foods? I do suggest to eat fermented foods. I guess I would want to see what the science was behind it being not good for us? Um, for probiotics, mm -hmm. do you recommend taking them after we have been on or doing a round of antibiotics? Mm. So the studies that I've seen when it comes to probiotics after antibiotics is that if you want to have Reproliferation of good gut bacteria that sticks around and is steady. Start with food, start with your typical, you know, like your healthy lifestyle habits, your sleep, no alcohol, hydration, plant based intake. You can take in conjunction with that probiotics, but probiotics are not going to replace the importance of dietary 
intake to help a good gut microbiome. So I personally, when I have patients who take anti, who need an antibiotic, I don't say every time take a probiotic. I will say that I, um, one particular situation where I've seen that is patients with C. difficile infections. Another p situation where I've seen that is patients who get really bad yeast infections when they take antibiotics. But those are very specific. That's very patient specific. I don't, I don't make a generalizable statement like that. Um, just some comments to follow up about the fermented. Dr. Greger talks about sodium and stomach cancer linked with fermented and his How Not to Die mm -hmm. book. I'm not sure what that. And Marcia said, for those of us, um, whoops, I just got, I just missed that. Hold on a second. My chat just went. Uh, Marsha, Marsha, those of us who are older who follow a whole food plant-based diet, how do we know the condition of our gut? <laughs> Question. Yeah. So, well, literally, I, you, you won't, right? Unless you're doing some type of like genome of, the, of your gut bacteria. Um, so I am a big proponent of listening to your body and then listening to what you're putting in your body. So you can presume that your gut is doing well if you are not getting sick a lot. If you are, you know, have good control of chronic diseases or don't have chronic diseases, you likely have good gut bacteria if you don't have a lot of intestinal discomfort. If you have frequent normal texture uh, bowel movements every day and you don't have big shifts in your bowel habits. Those are usually good gauges for knowing that your gut health is, is under good control. Right, right, good point. And Phil has one last one here. Um, if you could, the study on the all-cause mortality versus carbohydrate intake, um, he says, it's hard for me to understand why 50% has a lower HR than 80%. Hmm. This guy. Well, as you can see, even as it goes up toward the 80%, it's not that big of a all hazard ratio compared to the low, low ends of the spectrum. So if we're talking ideal, we're talking at the bottom of that U curve, but even as you move up toward the 80%, again, it's not, to me that, to me, like when I apply that to a generalizable population, that's not shocking. Um, to me, but as you go toward, what's shocking to me is maybe toward the lower end of the spectrum there, where it's so mm -hmm. clearly a link to all-cause mortality. Uh, I also think about crowding out. So if you're um, eating such a significant proportion of carbohydrates, we can't forget the importance you know, of protein intake, fat intake of all of our mac macronutrients. So I think we need to remember that that plays into it too. Above yeah, that- I just no, please. I'm sorry. I'm reminded of T. Colin Campbell when, when his recommendation is, and maybe that's what Phil is referring to, 80% of our calories from complex carbohydrates, 10% protein, 10% fat. Mm -hmm. If you're, it's not a set in stone, but. It's um, not set in stone and it's not, it's also not like we can't, um, each study is going to likely come up with a different exact number based on their population data and their, their methodology. So I think we have to understand, and I, and I see this, sorry, an error. Okay. So I see, I see a lot, um, especially in the, in the field of medicine that I, that I practice with a focus on lifestyle, we tend to um, start to make our heads down a track of like all or none. Like it's black and white when it comes to nutrition, it's black and white when it comes to how much and what percentage and what the reality is like, we are very fluid beings. Um, our, our gut microbiome is no exception to that rule. Um, so when we eat and what we eat and how we eat and what percentage and whatnot is going to be different for each person and what resonates and helps your body function and feel its best. So also understand that these are all general guidelines to go by, but you need to also put that in the context of your own body 
and how you feel and what your underlying conditions might be and what your underlying medications, et cetera, might be. Wise point, thank you. That's the end of the questions for now. Okay, let me go back to here. So um, I did touch on epigenetics at the beginning, uh, just that, that concept of how your lifestyle affects um, your genetic expression. And I, I just wanna plug that even when, the, when you look at the data and the research studies about what helps positive epigenetic change, so disease reduction over time, it all comes back to the same stuff. So the epigenetics diet is compounds found in foods like broccoli, genistein, which is one of the isoflavones in soy products, resveratrol, red wine, um, green tea <laughs> compound, and then vitamin C in our citrus fruits. So I just do want to plug for that, that in my crazy mind, it's all interlinked. The epigenetic changes, the gut microbiome, our lifestyle, how we are, how the generations after us can be, it all comes back to the same stuff. And it's what we put in our mouths, maybe three times a day, maybe six, maybe two times a day, however many times you're eating. And it all is coming back to these similar types of compounds. Plant diversity is key. I, I'm hitting the same rut lately. Every time, every morning when I'm packing like my grape, to, my, um, grape tomatoes and like some hummus, I'm Did this freeze? Yeah, I, th yeah. I think she froze. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no. If anybody else has some good resources, if you could type them in the chat room, um, chat box, and I will put down all these resources that people are recommending to learn or exploring gut health. Hmm. I am guessing that she got off. I think, Marcia, the point she was trying to make is that we tend to get the same thing every day. We want diversity. Um, I always go by a multicolored variety of plant foods, grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables. They all, the synergy, how they work together to create a healthy gut. Thirty different plant foods a week. Okay. Um, do high fat foods contribute to abnormal gut? But even a plant based, uh, we can ask her. Other people, my opinion is that we want healthy plant fats, as in avocados, um, some nuts seeds, those are all part of a healthy diet. Oils, not so much, no. Um, because the oils are very, here she comes, the oils are very processed and pro-inflammatory, so I would stay away from oh. There you are, okay. I mean, how embarrassing for my screen to go like, or my internet to go right then, that's amazing. So That's okay. We're having a party here. We're having a fine time. No problem. I'm sorry. No problem. It happens. You know, this happens. Well, I, I only had two slides left anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was just talking about plant diversity. Eat lots of different plants. Okay. Questions. <laughs> um, how many grams of fiber per day is ideal? I've heard 25 grams. That's a whole lot of fiber. So yeah, 25 is actually, in my mind, a little bit low still. I aim for closer to the 35, 40. 
Um, when it comes to fiber studies, uh, the majority of our population, I'm talking 97 plus percent of the US is fiber deficient. I mean, that's astounding. So the majority of studies that are done when it comes to fiber are in our like pitiful low amount of fiber intake um, that, is, that is typical. So closer to that 30 to 40. Okay. I can start looking um, at the chat too, let's see. That's okay. Um, okay. It says diverse foods, Oh, I change up the grains, veggies every day. Um, oh, did you have something you want to say about hummus when your screen froze? <laughs> I love hummus. I'll say that. Um, hummus. What about the hummus you were talking about when your screen froze? Oh, uh, I guess I was talking about that is part of my plant diversity when I have my lunch. Um, hummus is also a really great way to, in, and Brittany can speak more to this, but increasing your plant diversity by all of the things that you put with your hummus. And I was talking about my lunch and how I would pack to tomatoes and think, well, man, I should be packing more than just tomatoes. That's what I was saying. <laughs> um, any better forms of plant-based proteins? Um, ideal grams per day. I always go by the recommended daily. It's thirty six percent of body weight. Is that what you go by, Natalie? If people want to know how many much protein? Yeah, so i I'm gonna admit that I don't tend to have people counting all of their macronutrients in that way. I just say eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, yeah. But I am very much a proponent of that healthy relationship with food of not, you know, overthinking it. So I admit that. Yeah, no, that's, a, I think that's the right way, you know, and, and Connor, just to know that um, you don't have to worry about proteins. Broccoli has protein. Uh -huh. Spinach has protein. So, um, I, I, Natalie has the right answer there. You just eat and you enjoy. I really, a lot of times also, um, when it comes to protein, like, again, I keep saying it, listening to your body. So it, the majority, again, the majority of our country on the standard American diet gets twice, if not more of the amount of protein that they, that they need. My husband's protein level has been 5.6 for a year now that, that I'm not going to speak to medical diagnosis on that, but I would say that's something that you should talk to your doctor about if that actually correlates with protein um, food intake versus other issues causing that low number. But I, I, I obviously can't make a diagnosis on that. Are there any other resources that you recommend if for people interested in gut health, this whole topic? Yeah, so obviously Fiber Fueled, love that, um, love that book. Um, also, obviously anything from Michael Greger, is another another great resource right now. Um, there there aren't any other ones that I you know regularly follow. I just stick to those two for now. Okay. Yeah, I told them I would include a couple of those when I email them to Mark and a couple that I have. Um, okay. And I looks like a final question is: Can you suggest plant foods that are better for gut health than others? Um, again, it's the diversity of them. So it's, it's, it's not so much one, again, we're not going all or none and we're not talking like isolating things. We're talking about the, the, the synergistic effect of all of them. Right. Right. Well, um, yeah. One that I guess uh, Millicent said, my uh, husband's iron level. Anything to help low iron? Yep. So there are there are great like lists and infographics online that you can look up that are plant foods high in iron that I typically like to to hand to my patients when we go through that. Um, just talking about you know the foods that that tend to have higher levels of that than others. Um, but I can't, you know, I can't speak to 
what someone should or should not eat when they have like a diagnosis like that, because yeah. I don't know why his iron levels are low. <laughs> yeah. 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 But agreed with Brittany eating, eating vitamin C when you are eating iron rich foods is imperative for iron absorption. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just final here. We have one more minute. Is there anything you want to say about vitamin B12? Um, I will say the only vitamin B12 deficiencies I've ever diagnosed were in meat eaters. Um, that is not to say that plant-based people can't have them. Of course they can, but that is to say that anybody is at risk for a B12 deficiency. And it's recommended that everyone take a B12 um, supplement, not just vegans. Um, and finally, Ellie asks about digestive distress. Um, I know cooking, makes it easier on the digestion for like the cruciferous vegetables, the beans. She wants to know, is there any way to prevent uh -huh. digestive distress? Yeah, one of the main ways is to eat more, <laughs> more of them more and uh, more often. Um, and, but like Dr. Bolshewitz says is going slow and low. So eat smaller amounts of them over time. But what I mean is eat them more frequently so that you're able to start to adjust. Right. And I like is what just piggyback on what you said, not everybody body and God is the same. And mm -hmm. yes, you have to medical conditions, whatever. I will put my um, contact information in here and I'm sure you'll send that out, Sally. I will well. send it out with the email. Yes. Right. Okay. I appreciate this, Dr. Gentile. Um, well, everyone will get information and the, good, thank you. And the recording um, tomorrow, later on in the day. And this was so informative and everybody here is saying thank you and cheering you on. This, thank, thank you, you so much, this is really. Thank you, really have a good night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sally and Brittany for putting this on. You are so welcome. Nice to see you. Same here.